We are in a series called Joy Unstoppable. And you know what? The reality is there are many things that try to stop our joy. Each and every one of us. If you're a human being here this morning, and most of you seem to be, um, <laughs> I can guarantee that you are going through struggles and challenges that may, at times, stop our joy from happening, stop our joy from filling us. Sometimes we get focused on the circumstances of our life, and when we do, uh, we can get discouraged and we can become uh, uncomfortable. And the reality is that every single one of us is going through this because we're alive in a world that is broken. We go through day after day after day challenging circumstances that really cause us to, uh, to lose this joy that we should have. In Christ, we should have a joy that is unstoppable. And that is my prayer for each and every one of us in this congregation, that, that our circumstantial happiness would be replaced with Jesus-filled joy. And so today, I know, um, I, don't, I haven't been following you around, so I don't know your specific uh, things that are discouraging you or your specific things that are bringing you currently uh, discomfort, but I do know the answer. The answer uh, is quite simple. It is this humility that we find in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. He modeled for us how to have joy unstoppable. And today, we are going to look at an amazing passage that helps us understand uh, how do we deal with our discouragement? How do we deal with our discomfort? Now, I put a question up on the screen, and it says, are you discouraged and dealing with discomfort? I already told you. I already know you are. So the answer is we all are. Now, like I said, I don't know the specific ways that you're battling discouragement or that you're battling discomfort, but maybe for you, as you sit here this morning, maybe the things that are discouraging you could be uh, maybe your finances. It could be maybe relationships. It could be maybe a physical illness. Uh, this past week, I injured my back, so I'm in discomfort right now. And the reality is all of us are either in relational, physical, or circumstantial discomfort of some kind that if it goes on and on and on, it actually causes us to feel great discouragement. And most often when people come to church, you know, you hear this phrase, you know what, leave your problems at the door and come in and just worship Jesus. This morning I'm saying, you know what, bring your problems in here. Bring them in. Because Jesus can handle them. I don't want any of us to think, you know what, the parking lot is the place for our problems. The reality is bring in reality into this room and confess honestly before the Lord saying, you know what, Lord, I'm discouraged. It's better to be honest about that than go into denial mode. It's better to be honest and say, you know what, I'm discouraged. I'm battling this circumstance that I can't solve. First of all, you weren't meant to solve it. Secondly, there is one who can solve it. And today, we're here because of Jesus. And today, we're going to look at how did Jesus bring joy even in discouraging and discomforting circumstances. This passage that we're going to look at is Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11, and the words will be on the screen as well, but if you have a Bible or a phone or a, a tablet of some kind, uh, feel free uh, to join us. And it says, uh, Philippians 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 1 says, uh, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any partic participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, 
having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're going to pause there for a few minutes. At the beginning, uh, in verse 1, it says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ. Is there encouragement in Christ? Yeah, there is. Paul is not saying, you know what, the, there, there might be. He's saying there is, and since there is, since the actual, the word since should be at the beginning of this, but it's not. It says, it, sh it should say, since uh, there is encouragement in Christ, and there is comfort in his love, and there is particip participation in the Spirit, and there is affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Paul is saying, you know what? I know that you're dealing with discouragement. I know that you're discomforted in your lives. Church in Philippi, he, as he's writing this letter, he says, I know you're going through that, but make my joy complete by being like-minded. And then he says, okay, I'm going to go on to explain what it means to have the mind of Christ. Paul is not saying like-minded with him. Paul is saying that we're like-minded with Christ. And Paul was like-minded with Christ. So in a sense, it's follow me as I follow Christ. But Paul is saying, realize that encouragement and comfort doesn't come from fixed circumstances. Encouragement and comfort comes from Jesus. If we look at that verse, at verse, uh, verse 1, it says, if there's any encouragement in Christ. He's not saying in Paul. He's not saying in your circumstances. He's not saying in your ability to control your life. He's saying in Christ. And so it's important that we all this morning realize that our encouragement when we are discouraged, that our encouragement comes from Christ. And when it comes from Christ, we can be radically changed by his good news called the gospel. And Paul, when he goes on to explain the mind that we're supposed to have, what our thinking is supposed to be like, he says, have this mind among you. We're going to actually continue on to the next the next slide, it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in likeness of, a, of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Paul is unpacking what it means to have the mind of Christ. He is saying, you know what? There are seven things, seven truths, seven realities that as followers of Jesus Christ, we can apply to our life. And actually, we can't. I misquoted myself there. We cannot make this happen. It's God that makes this happen in us. But what he is getting at is there are seven different things that, uh, that seven different truths that he is communicating to this church in Philippi, but he also wants us to know the reality of these seven truths. So we're going to march through what it means to have this mind, to have this mind of Christ, to be united as a church body, and to all be on the same page. Now, the way to find joy unstoppable isn't by us going and finding what makes us happy. It's by going and finding Jesus. 
And if there is anything in your life that makes you more happy than Jesus, that is a potential idol in your life. That is an idol that is getting in the way of this, this happening. And for all of us, um, the, the reality is that we can only have this mind as Christ grants it to us, as he gives us this, this mind. But he modeled out how to have the mind of Christ. And as we go through these steps, uh, I hope we understand that this is not going to go easy. This is not an easy way of life. Our human nature, we fight against this. The first part, it says, he emptied himself. So if we follow Christ's example, the very first thing he did in verses 5 through 11 was he emptied himself. Now that goes totally contradictory to what we want to do. We want to fill ourselves up. We want to be in control. We want to make things happen. And the reality is he's saying, you know what? Empty yourself of yourself so that I can fill you. And honestly, this is a challenge. There are moments where you're like, you know what? You go on a silent retreat or you go on a, a mountaintop experience. Maybe as a church group, you go on a retreat and you, and you come back and you're like, oh, I feel so full of God because I've been able to just surrender myself to God. But then we go back to our normal everyday life and we pick ourselves up again and we put ourselves where, where Jesus is meant to take up and reside in us. We put ourselves back in that place. So he's saying, you know what? Jesus emptied himself. Therefore, we get to empty ourselves. That takes humility for us to think, you know what? I need to empty myself. I need to not think I have it all together, not think I have all the answers, but know that as I empty myself, Jesus is going to do a work in and through me that I can't do on my own strength. Many of us, myself included, are so very self-reliant that we go through our everyday life thinking, you know what, I can control this circumstance. I can make this happen. I can change people. I can, I can, I can, I can, all these I can statements. The reality is we can't. We need to sur surrender to the one who can. So it does take emptying ourselves, coming before a holy God and saying, you know what, I am broken, empty, I want to empty myself of me so that there is more of you in, lived out in and through my life. What that honestly means is that we need to die to ourselves and come alive to Christ. So it doesn't sound very exciting that the way we find joy is by dying to ourself. That almost sounds con contradictory in and of itself, but it isn't. When we die to ourself and come alive to Christ, we will never, ever be more alive than that. Secondly, Paul uh, goes on to explain to the church in Philippi that Jesus became a servant. Many of us would rather not be a servant. We'd rather not put the towel over our arm and walk in a manner of, I am here to serve. Now, often I have the opportunity to uh, have conversations with people that are leading districts, um, the, the Converge district that this church is a part of. Um, I talk with the, the president of the Converge denomination for the state of Wisconsin in Upper Michigan, and the president of the state of Wisconsin in Upper Michigan for Converge sounds like a position of authority. Ken Navi, who has that position, sees his role as one of servant. He's here to serve the churches. He is not here to be over the churches or have authority. Jesus has authority over the churches. Ken is here as a servant to humbly come before the churches and say, how can I best be a resource with how God has wired me? How can I best be a resource to be used by God to serve? And I see that humility modeled uh, in countless different church leaders. But honestly, if we look at the life of Jesus Christ, he humbled himself, and he became a servant. He 
He came as a child. And that's actually our next point, that he, he came. He, we're going to talk uh, about his humble birth in a stable. He came as a servant and was born as a helpless little baby in a stable, in a barn. He was laid in a feed trough as a demonstration of his humility. The God of all creation, the God who is powerful above all else, became man, was born of Mary, and was born in a humble setting. He, he was the ruler of the entire universe, yet he came as a baby. And I want all of us to think about what does that look like in our lives. First of all, to empty ourselves. Secondly, to see ourselves as servants of others. And thirdly, to, be, to, to accept how, where God has placed us. Do you know God placed you in the exact right family? He placed you in the family that you needed to be placed in. He had you born in the right city at the right time, in the right place. Just as Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in a manger, a couple thousand years ago, we all have been placed exactly where God wants us. And it's humbling sometimes to realize that God placed us right where he wants us, and he uses our family to influence us, even though it may um, be challenging, it may be a struggle. He is using that family to shape us so that we can demonstrate who Jesus is to the world. Fourth, we see um, that he lived a humble and simple life. So not only was he willing to empty himself, be, become a servant, be born in a stable, but he walked a simple life. If you measure Jesus' success rate as a pastor, he did a horrible job. Um, he did not succeed. He failed miserably. If you look at the life of Jesus, he ministered, his public ministry was about three years long. Um, for the first number, for the, about the first two years, he had about 12 followers. If you have a church, if you're a pastor and you have a church of 12 people after three years or two years, our society would, our society would say, you know what, you have failed. This is not working. This is not the way you do this. But Jesus was discipling his disciples, and at Jesus' death, there were at most about 120 followers of Jesus Christ on earth. And by all measures, he did not do a very, very good job, but he did. And all of us are sitting in this room as a result of his ministry and his work 2,000 years ago because he saw that the value wasn't in how many people he impacted, but how, how deeply he impacted a few. And as he lived his life, he modeled humility. He came to serve us. He came to live this humble and simple life but at the end of his ministry, this humble and simple life was to the point of obedience, a, a humble obedience to his father. And in this passage in Philippians, it says not only a humble obedience to his father, but it marks out what that looks like exactly. And what it looks like exactly is a self-sacrificing death on a cross. Once again, getting back to the reality that Jesus died so that we might have life, so are we willing to die to ourselves so that others might have life? Are we willing to sacrifice our own comfort and say, you know what, my comfort is not found in my circumstance. My comfort is found in Jesus. I am encouraged by Jesus. And so I can, I can sacrifice myself. I can die to myself so that I come alive to Christ. And as I come alive to Christ, Others will see a joy within us, and as we live our life, more and more people will come to know Jesus. Lastly, Jesus didn't exalt himself. 
at the end of this passage, Jesus didn't say, you know what? Look at me. Aren't I amazing? The one that exalted and lifted Jesus high and actually resurrected him from the dead is God the Father. And this morning, we celebrate Father's Day, and we, the reality is that God the Father resurrected Jesus and brought him back to life. He exalted him. He raised him up so that we might see that we shouldn't raise ourselves up. We shouldn't say, you know what? Look at me. We should look to the, better, the, the interest of someone else. We should look at how can we humbly serve others as Christ humbly has served us. Now, humility doesn't come easily. This is like peeling back an onion. This is the process of us dying to ourselves and coming alive to Christ, emptying ourselves of our own selfish wants, our own needs, our own desires, our own agendas, and saying, Jesus, I want to be filled with more of you in my life. This happens typically for most followers of Jesus Christ in steps. This is called sanctification. So we are justified, we are saved when we pray to receive Christ and we believe in his name, we are saved. But the reality is Jesus doesn't stop there. There is this ongoing process of sanctification. And what that means is that as Jesus and his glorious gospel goes into our life, the Holy Spirit reveals to us our own selfishness. And when we're aware of that and we confess our sin before God, he is faithful and just, and he'll forgive us of our sin, and he cleans us out. He does a cleansing work to make us new, to make us more like Jesus. And the goal of this morning is that each and every one of us would have a joy that's unstoppable because our joy is found in Jesus, and Jesus is eternal. He will never, ever fail you. I've said uh, countless times that if you hang around me long enough, I will fail you. There, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for loving me. Um, but the reality is, if we're looking for someone that will never fail us, someone that will always love us, someone that will always accept us, someone that will never deny us, that is found in only one place, and that place is Jesus. And as we spend more and more time with Jesus, we are going to become more like Jesus, but it is not an easy process. It's a process of us peeling back the onion and getting down to the core of what's really going on inside. And that takes actually some intentional, quiet time with Jesus. This isn't something that if you have quiet time, you're going to become more like Jesus. This is the process of, as we realize that the Holy Spirit is, is lighting up our life in a positive way, as, as the Holy Spirit is revealing our sinful ways to us, he is going to transform our thinking, transform our, our minds, and give us the mind of Christ. My desire is that each and every one of us in this room would die to ourselves and come alive to Christ. That we would say, you know what, Jesus, I honestly want to empty me so that more of you fills me, so that when people that I encounter on my, in my everyday life, when they see me, what they see is Jesus. I don't want people to see me anymore. I want them to see Jesus. And the reality of all this is this is what Jesus wants to do. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to make us new day by day. But it takes a breaking in us for the light switch to flip on. It takes Jesus breaking our hearts and the Holy Spirit convicting, of us, convicting us of our sin not in a, a way of condemna condemnation, but in a way of saying, you know what, this is the truth of what's going on in your wayward heart. The reason the Holy Spirit reveals that to us is so we can confess that sin before God and that he can cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness, and then he can shine through us. Uh, here's a glow stick. The reality of a glow stick is it doesn't shine until it's broken. And the reality for each and every one of us is being broken, being humbled by God, doesn't feel good, and many times we run away from that. I want to encourage you not to run away from that, but run into that and say, Jesus, break me of me so that I can empty myself of myself and be filled with your presence so that what, Jesus, what people see around me is the light of Jesus shining in and through my life. Don't run away from what feels like pain. There's a good pain and there's a bad pain. I think I, I, I shared this before, but a number of years ago, I was helping build walls at our cafe in Fond du Lac, and I put a nail through this thumb. Um, that's an example of bad pain. Nothing good came out of that, except for maybe me not using nail guns anymore. <laughs> but there is a good pain. And when someone goes to a workout facility, goes to the YMCA and lifts, you build muscle, you grow in strength. And as we come before the Lord in humility and say, Lord, break me, reveal to me any sin that is in me, empty that so that I can be filled with more of you, help me live this Jesus life, one of humility, coming before you, Lord, and, and saying, Lord, I am yours. Do whatever you want to do in and through my life. My life is no longer mine. I have been bought with a price. My, my life is not my own. I have been bought with a price. I am his. And my prayer is that that happens for all of us. And when we live that way, there is a joy that is unstoppable, that takes place. We cannot, our, our joy can't be taken away because our joy is in Jesus. And Jesus cannot be stopped. So I want to encourage you, wherever you're at this morning, uh, whether maybe, maybe you walked into this place and you don't yet know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, my prayer is that this morning you would take the opportunity to come up front after the service and talk with me or talk with uh, one of us that uh, would be willing to talk with you, maybe someone that brought you to church this morning. You could talk with them or talk with me about what does this mean to follow Jesus? What does this mean that he would be your Lord and Savior and that he could forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness? What does that mean? But if you're sitting here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're saying, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm still discouraged. Why do I feel so discouraged? I, wanna, I want you to understand that's normal because we live in a sin-soaked world. But I want to encourage you to Prayer, pray this dangerous prayer of saying, you know what? Jesus, help me die to myself and come alive to you. Help me empty myself. Jesus, take away my own wants, my own needs, my own desires, and replace them with yours. That's my hope and prayer this morning. And so let's pray to that end right now. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. Lord, I thank you that you not only um, love us, but Lord, you've called us this morning to have a joy that is unstoppable. Lord, help us realize that dying to ourselves is a good thing. That this rea reality of emptying ourselves of our own wants, our own needs, and our own desires is exactly where you'd want us to be. Lord, I pray that you would clean house. I pray that you would empty us so that we may be filled with you. Lord, I know that's a dangerous prayer because you will be faithful to it. You will empty us. And Lord, it'll be a glorious time when we realize that life is not about us, it is about you. Our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. 
Lord, I pray that as we die to ourselves and come alive to you, I pray, Lord, that those around us would see your light shining brightly. I pray that we would not uh, think life revolves around us, but, Lord, that everything that we're doing in our daily life, day in and day out, revolves around you and your work in and through us. So, Lord, I pray that you would use your church to proclaim your good news to a hurting and broken world. And Lord, I pray all this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.